Hello, and welcome to an introduction to the subject. My name is Dr. Swati Nathpal, and I'll be taking you through the topic today. At the end of every topic, we expect that you'll meet a set of key topic learning outcomes. For this particular topic, you're expected to define the concept of sustainability, understand that sustainability has economic, social, and environmental dimensions, and finally, explain why sustainability is increasingly important for business. While this lecture will cover some of the theoretical aspects of these outcomes, you're also expected to complete any prescribed reading and attend any associated seminars to be able to confidently tick all these boxes. So let's start off with the first topic, ILO, our definition of sustainability. There are numerous definitions of sustainability. For the purposes of this subject, we will adopt this definition, which is sometimes more commonly known as the Brundtland definition. It states that sustainability involves development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This definition of sustainability is widely adopted globally and is the foundation for the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are a leading global framework for international cooperation to achieve sustainability, and we'll cover this in a separate topic. So from the Brundtland definition, we can start to build a picture of what sustainability comprises. We can see that sustainability requires a concern for the triple bottom line. In other words, into the related concepts of the economy, the environment, and society. It also highlights the, an equitable balance of current and future generations needs, or what we call inter and intragenerational needs. These two concepts are really important in the subject. Intergenerational equity refers to equity considerations between the current and future generations, while intragenerational equity relates to considerations among current generations. So starting off with intergenerational equity, the idea behind this and the issue of fairness has to do with how decisions we make today are likely going to impact and reduce the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And similarly, issues of equity also arise within current generations such as equal and fair access to things like sanitation and healthcare. Importantly, sustainability is also about conserving and enhancing current resources we have, and that because we do live on a planet, planet that's finite, and it's increasingly important to preserve and find better ways to use those resources. Finally, it's also about changing the way businesses see these issues. The days of only considering the financial bottom line are limited. Businesses really need to think more broadly about their role in society, the environment, and how to be responsible corporate citizens. The concept of systems is fundamental to sustainability, and we'll address it in detail in a separate topic in this subject. But let's start off with some definitions. Danella Meadows, who is one of the seminal thinkers in this space, defines a system as a coherently organized set of interconnected elements. Systems can range from relatively simple systems, such as a bicycle, where the different components work together to make it move. But they can also be quite complex, for example, the Earth's atmosphere as a system. A property of every system is that its identity is always more than the sum of its parts. In other words, the whole system seeks to produce something more than you would expect from the individual parts, because the way those individual parts combine adds a very different quality to the whole system. Business organizations can also be thought of as systems, and we adopt that understanding in this subject. 
particularly, we ask you to think of businesses as open systems that exist within specific economic, social, and environmental contexts. Not just as closed systems where decisions are made that only impact the organization itself and nothing around it. So in addition to the four core principles that were outlined in the previous slide, there are six other concepts that we can relate to sustainability. Firstly, a long-term or future orientation. So it's not enough to just look at yearly organizational results. Planning should really focus on longer term objectives and sustainability competences that are needed in the future, not merely short term profitability. Change and transformation. Now change as a result of sustainability will be inevitable for most organizations. And so it's important to manage that change effectively so as to create continual transformation within the organization. There's also, as we've mentioned before, a need for systems thinking. So organizations are social systems that play an integral part in the overall social system in which we live. Next, quality of life and well-being. The level of satisfaction that people have with their living circumstances and that essence of equity that we spoke about is also critical in our understanding of sustainability. Now, forms of capital. There has been a historical emphasis on financial capital as being the main and the only type of capital. However, there's increasing acknowledgement of the role of natural capital, human capital, and social capital in actually presenting a more holistic picture of when thinking about capital. And then finally, acknowledging limits to growth. We live in a world where resources are not infinite. Therefore, there are limits to potential growth. And this suggests that we need to search for alternatives, you know, such as alternatives to fossil fuels and other exhaustible and non-renewable resources. Now that we're done with the first topic, ILO, let's take some time to review and reflect do you think this definition is true or false? Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present while compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. What do you think the answer is? It is of course false because the key is it does not compromise the ability for future generations to meet their own needs. Now let's look at the second question. Which of the following areas does sustainability not focus on? Is it A, B, C, or D? Take some time to pick the right answer. The correct answer is B. The financial success of individual businesses is not really a focus of sustainability and certainly not in this subject. Now let's turn our attention to the second topic ILO, which is the triple dimensions of sustainability. The three pillars of sustainability are a powerful tool for defining the complete sustainability problem. This consists of at least the economic, social and environmental pillars. If any one particular pillar is weak, then the system as a whole is unsustainable. For example, the financial crisis had implications for the environment and society, not only the economy. Similarly, Climate change has implications for society and economies. Therefore, any viable or sustainable solution to global problems requires a consideration of all three of these dimensions. 
So let's take a little more of a detailed look into each of these dimensions because they are standalone pillars, even though they work together. So for example, with the environmental dimension, it's a recognition of how we use and depend upon the natural environment. So it's also an identification of important environmental issues that businesses should be aware of. And we'll look at some of these in the next topic item. When we think about the economic dimension, it's really looking at the micro, so at a business level, but also at the macro level. So issues of consumption, for example, or globalization. And there are also two important ways you can think about economic sustainability. Internal, so that's the financial health of the organization and external, where you add value to others. However, for the purposes of this subject, as I said, we don't really focus too much on the internal aspects of a, financial, of, um, a business with financial health. And then finally, the third pillar, which is often what I like to think of as the poor cousin when it comes to the three pillars, because the social tends to be overlooked um, more often than not. Um, we'll cover this in quite a bit of detail in a separate topic, um, but of course it is important to introduce it at this stage. So the three main elements um, as they relate to society uh, for businesses are the provision of a safe and positive work environment for the employees, their contractors, suppliers, and a range of other stakeholders. Also highlighting businesses' responsibility to their customers and corporate social responsibility. So that's a business's legal, ethical, economic, and philanthropic responsibility to its social stakeholders, um, which include, as I said, everything from internal to external stakeholders. So it's really understanding how these three dimensions work together to create more equity for current as well as future generations. Okay, so that was a short um, topic ILO, um, so it's, but it is still important that you review and reflect on what you've just learned. Um, so we'd like you to take some time to identify at least two social, economic and environmental dimensions related to each of these sectors. So we've given you a head start with agriculture, um, outlining what an, an example of an economic, environmental and social dimension. Now we'd like you to take some time to identify those three dimensions for the copper mining and furniture manufacturing industry. So think about that and so take about five minutes or so to jot down your understanding and discuss it with either someone at home or when you go to your class. Now for topic ILO 3, we're going to look at explaining why sustainability is increasingly important for business. A number of studies have identified various ways in which sustainability can be good for business. Some of these include cost reduction, increased revenues, a better risk profile, enhanced brand reputation, and innovation. And we'll now take some time to look at each one of these in more detail. Starting with cost reduction, operating costs can be cut through improved efficiencies that come from reduced resource use and cutting waste so that basic idea that if you switch off the lights you'll save on your energy bills it's a very simple example but you get the point um, or also you could do so by reducing staff turnover that's associated with more worker-friendly policies again remembering the social pillar in that context and it's also possible that addressing sustainability issues in a planned and systematic way can be helpful in getting ahead of government regulations and that can be more cost effective in the medium and long term. In terms of increased revenues, um, you can create new products that are more sustainable or services and that can increase your traditional market share or connect to new markets. So the market, 
for example, for electric cars is a classic example of new products and services that are more sustainable. Community support initiatives can also increase public awareness of the business, thereby supporting higher sales. And you can also encourage greater productivity amongst your employees by implementing sustainability programs, such as corporate volunteering programs or greening programs and things like that. Importantly, sustainability can help a business improve its risk profile. So by being more sustainable and sticking to sustainability principles, it can help business reduce the risks, for example, being involved in accidents and very expensive litigation. It also makes it easier to get insurance and finance and can be cheaper to get these critical business services. It can also enhance a company's brand reputation uh, through improving customer loyalty, attracting investors and and offering competitive advantage in the marketplace. So this can also help in securing better contracts and partnerships in the supply chain. So for example, in the public sector, a lot of the tenders, the court tenders, have a clause requiring businesses to outline their sustainability credentials. And that can actually help certain businesses win contracts over others. And finally, innovation. Uh, the process of adopting sustainability involves innovation and good general business skills. So if you think about the market for renewable energy, electric vehicles, um, more sustainable and ethical supply chains, all these innovations are becoming more and more important to improve the overall risk profile, but also general financial um, performance of the business. So now just a couple of really quick examples of what some businesses have been doing to build sustainability into their business processes. Microsoft, for example, in 2012 announced a commitment to be carbon neutral um, and lowering their emissions in over a hundred countries. And so what this involved was improving their efficiency um, of their current systems, having more share of renewable energy in their, um, in their energy mix, and also retrofitting businesses with more clean and more um, efficient energy solutions. These are some of the ways that Microsoft did that. Around the same time, Whole Foods became the first major North American retail chain to sell only seafood harvested in a sustainable manner. So the company worked with the Marine Stewardship Council to participate in its certified sustainable seafood program. So what they did was they sourced their food directly from fishing companies and process it themselves thereby making it easier to track and verify the source and species of the seafood that was on offer. The strategy results in no net negative impact by their own company or on the future supply of their product. So now while we've looked at the significant opportunities that businesses have um, in being more sustainable, there are still a number of challenges and threats on the horizon. Arguably, climate change is perhaps the force that's most likely to impact on business. Um, the predictions of annual output losses from climate change range between 1% per year uh, if strong and early actions are taken to as much as 5% a year if policymakers fail to act. So that really is the huge, super wicked problem of our time and businesses are not immune to the risks that it poses. There are also a range of energy and fuel challenges that businesses face, mostly around the high volatility and unpredictability of fossil fuel markets because of higher energy demand. We've also seen changes in the geographical pattern of consumption, supply and production uncertainties, and also increasing regulatory intervention 
related to climate change um, and other strong trends that are creating energy and fuel challenges. Water scarcity becomes progressively worse since predictions show that by 2030, the global demand for fresh water will exceed the supply by 40%. So businesses may be vulnerable to water shortages, declines in water quality, water price volatility, um, and even reputational challenges that come from not being able to supply water in a timely um, and equitable manner. Another important consideration for businesses is around deforestation. Not only because forests produce wood that's um, required by businesses and construction and other areas, um, there's also downstream effects in industries such as pulp and paper, and also exposure to regulation that aims to stop um, deforestation from happening. Businesses also might come under increasing pressure to prove from customers, sorry, to prove that their products are sustainable through the use of certain standards. And the more businesses have to certify and adopt standards, the more direct and indirect costs they incur. Population growth is a constant force for sustainability because of the limits to growth that we spoke about. The pressure that it puts, population growth puts on Earth, for example, it's expected to grow to 8.2 billion by 2032 and more than 9 billion by 2050. So this will put a lot of pressure on natural resources such as food, water, energy, and raw materials. And these are all threats for business. Next, we can think of urbanization. Uh, that's where the growing majority of the population moves to live in cities. Um, in 2009, for example, for the first time ever, more people lived in cities than in the countryside. By 2030, it's expected that all developing regions, including Asia and Africa, are expected to have the majority of the inhabitants living in these urban areas. Virtually, the population growth over the next 30 years will be in cities. So this requires extensive improvements in infrastructure, construction, water, sanitation, and a whole other heap of public investment. Next, food security um, is a challenge going forward for businesses as well because of the increasing pressure that population growth, water scarcity, and deforestation put on global food production. So food prices are expected to rise 70% to 90% by 2030, and in water scarce regions that are exacerbated by climate change, they're likely to see a lot, you're like, we're likely to see a lot of competition for supplies with other water intensive industries and consumers. Government regulation is another area that business needs to keep an eye out for um, because we're starting to see that regulations are becoming more demanding and much more numerous. So as public and government concern about climate change, industrial pollution, food security, natural resource depletion, as the concern continues to grow, we'll start to see greater intervention from government with unprecedented levels of new regulations and policies. Finally, um, consumer concerns and employee interest. Consumers and employees are increasingly demanding companies to produce goods or services in a more eco-friendly and socially responsible way. And they're rewarding such companies for greater loyalty, embracing their new products, and some willingness to pay higher prices for those premium products and services. So overall, as you can see, I mean, we spent quite a bit of time on this slide, but there are a range of barriers and challenges that businesses need to navigate going forward as they relate to sustainability. For the review and reflection of this particular ILO, I found a cool little video that not only summarizes what we've just spoken about, but also highlights and builds on what we've spoken about in terms of business and sustainability. 
Enjoy. Our planet isn't in good shape. Currently, we are using the resources of one and a half planets. Make that two and a half if everyone was living by European standards, four if we were all Americans, and even worse, studies conclude that we've crossed several of nine planetary boundaries that are necessary for a safe and sustainable life. We want to ask, how can companies and corporations foster sustainable development? What is true business sustainability that helps overcome society's long-term problems? Business and sustainability? That doesn't go together. Yep, that's what the traditional economic paradigm preaches. The business of business is business, the American economist Milton Friedman once said. Only economic concerns like turnover, profit, market share, or shareholder value matter. Societal or ecological concerns mustn't distract private companies. That's what the government is for. We call this approach Business Sustainability 0.0. Jack Welch was a prominent advocate of this traditional model. As CEO of General Electric, he measured everything in terms of shareholder value. Neutron Jack laid off tens of thousands of employees and was widely admired and celebrated for his economic success. So how does sustainability enter the world of business? What role does it play there? In the first phase of business sustainability, companies react to social and ecological concerns. Economic objectives, however, remain the only priority. They just recognize that sustainability management may help them save costs, reduce risks, improve their attractiveness as an employer, and differentiate themselves from their nasty competitors. Sustainability management is all about managing the chances and risks that stem from economic, ecological, and social chances issues. And yes, that's where most companies are today, on the level of business sustainability 1.0, also called a refined shareholder value management. Sustainability as a means to an end, the end being economic success. A good example for this is Walmart, the world's largest retailer. Its sustainability strategy focuses on reducing things, energy, water, packaging materials, and transport routes, which fits perfectly well into Walmart's strategy. Every day, low prices. In the second phase of sustainability management, companies rethink their one-sided goal of profit maximization and pursue a triple bottom line approach. Value creation now goes beyond shareholders. Business is not only about economic, but also about environmental and social goals. In order to achieve these goals, organizations implement sustainability strategies and plans using sustainability management systems and proper reporting. This is Business Sustainability 2.0. The organization embeds the triple bottom line in its structure and defines and implements responsibilities and programs accordingly. For example, in 2010, Unilever, a fast-moving consumer goods giant, launched its Sustainable Living Plan. Its ambitious goals for 2020 include doubling of sales while cutting its environmental footprint in half and improving living conditions of millions of people along its supply chains. Time for a quick recap. There are three levels of business sustainability. Traditional management does not include social and economic sustainability. It's all about the shareholders. In Business Sustainability 1.0, social and environmental concerns are means to an end, the end being economic success. We call it refined shareholder value management. Business Sustainability 2.0 takes it up a notch by assuming a triple bottom line that includes not only economic, but also environmental and social goals. All three approaches share an inside-out view. How can companies avoid negative side effects? Of course, this is important, yet it doesn't go far enough. True Business Sustainability 3.0 isn't about reducing negative effects, but about creating positive ones. It is about active contributions to the world's sustainability problems, which requires shifting from inside-out to outside-in thinking. First, look at the challenges out there 
and then start addressing them using your own resources. Particularly startups and social businesses see these challenges as opportunities. They address societal and ecological issues without forgetting that at some point they have to become profitable and self-sufficient. Among the bigger and more established companies, only a few companies have renewed their business models by shifting from inside out to outside in thinking. One example is SV Group, a provider of catering services for companies in Switzerland. Together with Worldwide Fund, it has recently launched One Two We, a new food program that helps clients provide healthy food to their employees and reduce their carbon footprint at the same time. With this program, SV Group directly addresses the sustainability issue, climate change, making it an integral part of its offering. A second example is IKEA, a Swedish furniture giant. Through its foundation and in collaboration with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, it has developed an emergency refugee shelter that costs only 1,000 euros per piece, weighs 100 kilograms, and provides shelter for five people on 17.5 square meters. It is foldable, easy to transport, and already in use in Iraq, Ethiopia, and Syria, and parts of Europe. The challenges society faces are manifold and span across many fields. Nutrition, energy, mobility, economy, and agriculture. Two, solution-driven approaches not only require different business models, but also new forms of collaboration. Collaboration within supply chains, across industries, between private, public, and non-governmental actors, ultimately transforming the rules of the game. It may come as a surprise, but true business sustainability isn't such a new idea. Management guru Peter Drucker pointed out, every single social and global issue of our day is a business opportunity in disguise. Let's have a look at history like Nestle or Unilever only came into existence because founders set out to address pressing societal matters, such as infant mortality in Switzerland and hygienic problems in Victorian England. Which is why returning to the original purpose of business wouldn't hurt. We must directly link the sustainability goals of companies with the sustainability challenges of the world. Then we'll be talking about true business sustainability. Okay, so that's it for this topic. Um, remember to prepare for next week's topic by reviewing what we've learned today, reading any of the prescribed chapters and completing any online materials that are required. Please make sure to ask your seminar leader, or reach out to your seminar leader for any assistance or questions you have related to the topic. Thanks very much for your time today.